So today we're going to have a bunch of speakers, um, and in the first 30 minutes or so, we're going to have a, um, a presentation, like a short couple of slides um, that cover the Users Committee report from 2022B, though I don't see Matt here yet, but surely he will join in just a moment. Um, then we want to cover everything that's sort of new since June 2022, all the new tutorials, all the changes um, that have happened in the RSP, updates to the documentation, all that kind of stuff to give you a summary um, of what we've been working on over the past six months. And then a short look forward to 2023 before we go into the delegate flash talks, which uses a separate slide deck, which I will again pop a link to in the chat. So you can go ahead, if you haven't made a slide yet, you can use that link and go ahead and make a slide during the first 30 minutes um, so that you can participate later on. So I still don't see, oh, right. And then if there's time, we'll also do breakouts as per usual um, for our delegate assemblies. So I still don't see, Matt here, or anyone else from the users committee that was going to speak to these slides? I can see people are still joining. But okay, I'm just going to skip these. We'll come back to them later, see if Matt joins us just a bit late. And we'll just uh, go into our, our updates on things that have been released and updated since June. Uh, so to start, some of the data products that were released since June include um, three tables. The four source on DIA objects table was um, released a little bit after the main release at the end of June. That includes force photometry on the individual process visit images at the locations of all DIA objects. So if you didn't notice, uh, that has come out. So you can use that in addition to the DIA source and DIA objects catalog. The other two catalogs that came out a little after the end of June were the matches truth and truth summary tables, which contain the truth data and their matches to the object catalog. Um, so that's that's come out um, since then too. So you can find descriptions of all of these in the DP 0.2 data products definitions document. Um, now, if you go there, you'll see that it's been updated to describe them. And also I see that we have Matt now. So I'm going to back up a little bit and invite Matt to speak to the two slides that you made. Yeah, thank you. Sorry for being late. Um, yeah, so I am the, the chair of the uh, Ruben Users Committee. Um, I just put this slide up and we generally do just to give you a sense of what the Users Committee is about. Um, we, we solicit feedback really from you um, and have meetings twice a year, one in person and, and one virtual, and we consolidate our findings and report them to the operations director. Uh, you can see there's a you know list of the committee members um, and you know these people are really supposed to be drawn from a whole variety of scientific interests in in uh, Ruben. Uh, can we go to the next slide? So <clears throat> we we had a, a meeting in November. Um, we also met um, at the uh, PCW. Um, so, but I'm going to summarize um, our findings. There will be a report that's uh, in the final stages. But really, we want to congratulate the Ruben team and a shout out to Melissa in particular and other members of the community engagement team to, in, you know, their continued success with um, interacting and uh, engaging and encouraging the, the user com community. Um, the other findings we have are that the notebooks are some really fantastic tutorials and a lot of really good documentation related to the DP0 materials. These are really well done, very helpful, and, and we just encourage uh, that they continue to be improved. Um, <clears throat> there are um, a few more, I think, um, uh, important um, findings. There are some uh, user groups groups um, uh, that really don't have access to data that can help them prepare. Um, in particular, I use it as an example, um, the solar system groups that I'm a member of, uh, because we're interested in moving objects, 
it's a little more challenging to to make synthetic data data available, but it's really important so we can fully engage in helping with commissioning and preparing for operations. Likewise, um, there really needs to be effort to um, simulate some of the alert packets. These can be either come from the brokers or the project, but for similar reasons, um, these are you know to what I said before. This is really important for getting the encouraging the users to, to get up to speed. Um, there's also been some discussion about what level of need there is for target of opportunity observations, and how much time would be made available. And also it's important to establish some workable policies uh, related to TO observations. Um, and then finally, uh, we recommend that there, there be a report on the you know, characterization and validation of uh, DP 0.2. Looks like there was a couple of comments in the chat. I don't think that's... It's mostly just me posting okay. to the slides. Yeah. And um, that's really all I have. There'll be a little more detail, but not a lot more detail in, in the upcoming report. Um, yeah. Thank you, Matt. It looks like Leanne has a question for Matt. Hi. Um, thanks, Matt. Can, can everyone hear and see me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm at home today on, on just on my laptop. Um, thanks for this feedback, Matt. It's great to get feedback from the users committee on, on all of this. And um, uh, we'll certainly read uh, the report and, and uh, take your comments into consideration. I can, I can probably give you a little bit of feedback on a few of them already, though. Um, Right. In regards to uh, other sciences and the solar system groups and so forth and, and with DP0, we are well aware that DP0 doesn't serve a lot of sciences, and in particular that the solar system science is not well served by this, and we are thinking about how to um, come up with better ways to serve uh, the communities who aren't well served by DP0.2. So we don't have an exact plan yet, and I can't give you any exact details, but we are working on it, and there is going to be something. That's great to hear. That, that I can that I can I can say with confidence now. So watch this space. Um, there's, there'll be some information coming early in the new year. Uh, in terms of brokers and simulated alert packets, yes, this is absolutely on our agenda. I know that Eric Bellman and his team have already got some sort of basic simulated alerts packets that the brokers have been using more for sort of technical integration. Um, mm -hmm. But I think as we get into DP1 and DP2, we're definitely going to start ramping up the alert stream, and we have to test that, we have to verify it, and we have to be ready for year one. So. Um, I don't think that we're going to see any um, alert-based uh, um, examples in any DP0, uh, but DP1, DP2, uh, further down the line, uh, yes, we, we should at some point be seeing alerts. Um, they may be canned alerts, they might not be coming out on the 60 second time scale, but, but they will be coming. Um, and uh, yeah, the the you, you uh, mentioned at the end you're interested in a characteriz characterization and validation report for DP0.2. Um, is there anything in particular I'd like to know maybe a little bit more details about what you'd like to see here, what it is you're hoping to get from something like this, what you'd like to see? I, in think it's, I mean, I um, this is really something that's uh, more from Michael wood -Basie, but I think it's, you know, something that's going to give us a sense of what future reports will look like, um, you know, in, in later uh, data products, mm -hmm. you know, just sort of a... a you know, obviously, this is all all simulated, so you you know right. the characterization and validation. But I think just exercising the process of getting a report and and using the results, I think that's okay. what we had in mind. Okay, but, right. Um, one thing I can point you to is that with our um, um, with our regular releases, our, our our two per year releases of the the science pipelines, roughly two per year. I it's not exactly two per year. We put out a characterization metric report for those science pipelines. Yeah, yeah. On mm -hmm. precursor data sets, I can point you to that. You should find it with a, a link to it with the release notes. But we have tech notes for all of those, and that will give you a flavor of, say, some of the metrics that we run to try to characterize the performance of the processing. Um, mm -hmm. That's one place to start. It's not a full validation report on on the pipelines, but it does uh, it does uh, give you some indication of what we will do. That's that's great. Thank you. Okay, thanks both. And um, I'll say also the project will have a chance to respond to the Rubin Users Committee report once it's submitted, which I think is probably going to be pretty soon. Um, is there any final comments you wanted to make on this, Matt? Um, no, I, I mean, well, I, I guess, yes, that I would just encourage the users to uh, 
contact um, the user committee members if you have any anything you would like to dis discuss or report. Um, we encourage your involvement. Yes, good. I was going to emphasize that as well. I went back to the slide that has the contact um, info for the users committee. So any user can say, hey, I was trying to do this and, you know, it's not working right. And I can the users committee please discuss this topic. They're very open to those kinds of communications. And um, so that's how any user can contact the users committee. So they're there looking out for the users. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you very much, Matt, for making that presentation on behalf of the users committee. Uh, sounds like maybe um, maybe sometime next year we'll set up something to show the users committee that um, characterization and, and validation information that does already exist, um, so that mm -hmm. you can can take a look. That could be part of our next meeting. That sounds great. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, let's proceed with some updates since June. We already discussed the data products that have been released since the end of June. I wanted to point you to, um, remind, well, first remind you that documentation for the DP0.2 data set, this does exist. It's at dp0-2.lsst.io. It's your primary resource for everything related to the DP0.2 data release. And it also has lots of resources for delegates, like how to get support, the tutorials, all that stuff is all here. We are continually updating the information that's available via the documentation as we all learn more about DP0.2. Um, one of the biggest uh, changes recently is there's now a clear access point for new delegates to join. Previously, we'd sort of done new delegates in batches um, with the plus one sort of running on the side as a way for new people to join, but now it's sort of more of a continuous trickle of, of onboarding. So that link uh, for how to get started and for how to submit a request to participate is now right there on the main page, very easy. So that's the place where you point your colleagues to if you're talking about the cool stuff you're doing with DP0 and they say, hey, how do I get involved? You just send them here and they can onboard themselves. Um, so that's one big change. Uh, as a reminder, the recordings of all the delegate assemblies are usually available by the following week. Um, you find them by going to the main page, dp0-2.lsst.io, and you'll see a list under the resources for delegates. And one item on that list is the DP0 virtual seminars. And if you click it, you will get to the table at right that um, has not only our schedule, but also once the recordings are up, they are linked from here. So this is where you go to find the recordings of all of our delegate assemblies. So that's continually updated as we have new recordings. We've also been updating our notebook aspect how-tos, FAQs, troubleshooting tips, as we learn more about the common issues that people encounter and what are the usual ways to uh, get around those issues, we tend to try and update common things in the, in the documentation. So you can get there by clicking on the notebook aspect under DP0.2 data, um, data access and analysis tools on the main page, and you will get to the notebook aspect, um, all of our documentation for helping users with that. And you can see there in the list at lower right, there's the how to use notebooks, how to use tutorials, FAQs, and troubleshooting tips are all there. So it's a good um, extra little resource for users that we are continually updating. Another new thing is that we now have um, easy references for ADQL, what we call ADQL recipes. So like very common queries that you can copy paste um, and then update uh, for your own use. And also those Python functions, a couple of the functions that we use uh, in some of the notebooks, like um, making a, a cutout of a coad is a function that you could go into the notebook that has it and copy paste it, but that's a, you know one extra step. You have to know, open a notebook. So we've made these right in the documentation now. So these recipes, easy copy pasteable um, ADQL uh, queries, like one that converts fluxes to magnitudes, very common thing people want and also uh, like the ones for making um, cutout co-ads. So you'll find that also right from the main page, dp0-2.lsst.io, scroll down under the data access and analysis tools and you'll find links to the ADQL recipes and the Python functions. So those are all now there for you, a little bit easier. Um, we've also recently, well, maybe a month or two ago, we added a log of the major tutorial updates is now available for users. Um, so we do continually sort of update tutorials and we're always pushing new versions as we learn more. You'll find this log by, again, starting from the main page, dp0-2.lsst.io. You scroll down to 
for the tutorial section and you click on the DP 0.2 tutorials, it takes you to the page um, down, it takes you to a new page where you will find a what's new, see the log of major tutorial updates right at the top of that next page. And that'll take you to the log of major tutorials um, updates. So you can see here at right, the last update that we made was on October 26th, and it lists the tutorials that like the actual files that we updated. Um, so that's like an easy way to check if you're like, oh, is this new? Um, I don't think this tutorial did this before. You can just come here and be like, oh, yeah, they they improved it. And that's why mine is different now. So that should help a little bit. And then speaking of new and improved tutorials, this is a list of all of the tutorials that are either new or have had um, updates since June of 2022. So it's a, a pretty long list, including five brand new tutorials that we made once DP 0.2 was released. Um, so there's a lot there, as always, for you to go to. There's been additional updates um, for some of the portal tutorials, and we're now working on some command line tutorials as well. So the new stuff is just sort of going to keep coming um, as we learn more and are able to teach you more. There's also been a bunch of delegate contributions. So, so far we've had four delegates present their work during the delegate assemblies. Um, we can have many more in 2023. So you just get in touch and ask and we'll set something up for you, a time and a date that works well for you uh, and get you to present. The people who tend to present in the, in the delegate assemblies are also adding their notebooks, contributing their notebooks, their explorations um, to our delegate-contributions-dp02 repository. So I've starred the ones that are in that repository that match some of the presentations that we had in delegate assemblies, but there are a bunch of other directories also in that repository just um, give, providing some sort of extra science-based demos about PhotoZ, um, the extended disk parameter, how to use some additional desk truth catalogs, um, how to get the backgrounds from images. All of this is just contributed, contributed notebooks um, from the community that people can look at and, and you can use as sort of auxiliary, auxiliary information. So um, the README file in that repo has some instructions on how to contribute. We're, we're always happy to help with Git. We know a lot of people maybe don't yet use GitHub, they're not really sure how to contribute, just get in touch. Uh, we can always just hop on a Zoom for, you know, 10, 15 minutes and sort of get you sorted up with the branch or help you with your merge or whatever it is, it, that's no problem. So please do reach out if you're interested in contributing and sharing your work uh, via this GitHub repo. I think, right, one more thing before I hand it over for, to Frosty, and that's um, one of the RSP functionality upgrades that has happened this year is that the tutorial notebooks directory. We understand this has been an issue for many people. They go in, they open the notebook, they edit it, they save it. And then when we try to push a new version, clashes happen and Git tries to like resolve the clashes and you end up with unexecutable notebooks and it's a small disaster. So uh, we know that's been an issue. There are ways to fix it. So we've been providing like ways to fix it when that error happens. But what we really want is for that to never happen. And the way that never happens is for that directory to become um, read only. So now any new account will always have a read only version of the tutorial notebook. So you will always have the most up to date ones. There are actions that you can take now to make that directory read only. This is recommended and the instructions are all in the documentation. So if something funky is happening with um, that your tutorial notebooks directory in the notebook aspect of the Ruben Science platform, check this out or just get in touch and we can just sort of walk you through um, that change to make sure that you're always getting the most up-to-date versions. So that, that was a good big change. We like this change, it's very helpful. And now I'm gonna hand it over to Frosty to talk about some of the other RSP functionality upgrades this year. Yeah, so hi, and thanks again to everybody the volunteering their time to uh, help us get ready for the for the big big ribbon cutting for this eventually. Um, so just to quickly, there's been a lot of uh, work and updates uh, in the RSP in the last six months, but just to hit some of the science facing uh, high points uh, with DP 0.2, we introduced uh, our first version of our OpStop service. So this is a basically a VO standard that allows observations to be searched, you know, so you can get images back. 
Um, and, you know, you can, like with all our services, you can access it from the portal, the notebook, or directly through the API. Um, and so uh, this, is, uh, this is an example of uh, how the portal uses uh, Obstep under the hood, so that when you actually say, hey, give me, give me, an, give me an image in this coordinates, it gives you an image in this coordinates. So uh, that's pretty cool. Uh, next slide. Um, another service that we implement for the first time uh, for in the for release in June, July for DP 0.2 is the HIPS service. Uh, as most of you probably know, HIPS is a way to uh, uh, divide the sky up in predefined tiles so that you can you know you can you can zoom in uh, and get increasingly more uh, resolution as you go in. Um, which you know it's it's nice in and of itself, but here is an example of how now, ever since uh, June, when you do a catalog search in the portal, um, it pulls as the background to the display of your sources uh, the hips data from our own processing of the of the desk data um uh as as a background so now you can you can look with your own eyes uh and see um that the you know the sources and the that you the the positions of the sources that are being plotted are in fact also visible with the eyes so they're real so that's great uh next slide yeah, I actually started like writing several more slides and then deleting them all because uh, I'm sure you guys want to move on with your with your day. Um, but I just want to add a bunch of other things. Um, we have a uh, again a VO compliant data link service uh, that we are using in order to enhance the functionality uh, of the portal, so that the portal knows that, for example, with certain types of query results, you can you can you know you can get a light curve uh, or something like that from the data that has been returned. Um, we have uh, uh, an implementation of image cutout, the VO Soda service. Uh, there isn't yet a tutorial notebook, but uh, one will come along this year, I'm sure. Um, and we've done a whole bunch of uh, under the hood engineering. Um, the science platform is now being deployed in several locations around the world, uh, not by us uh, in every case. Uh, and so we are also uh, supporting this as a platform for uh, services for uh, to be deployed at other data centers. And so we've done a whole bunch of work to support that activity. And then if we just go to the next slide, which I think is the old thing, I want to say a couple of things about that. Okay, so, um, so far of you, those of you who have been using the system have been logging in with GitHub. That is something that we did uh, in order to release the service early to you. Um, the final required system uh, has a bunch of requirements that to do with it, like you being able to use your institutional ID, but also to have group management so that, you know, you can be in a group with your collaborators and only, you know, your collaborators can see your files and all that kind of stuff. Um, so the system that is the final system that fulfills those requirements uh it was uh, is just currently being prepared it's ready in the staging environment and being tested by our cet folks among other people um and we will release it after the double aas meeting uh in january to avoid any 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 kind of user support uh disasters over the holiday um and there will be documentation and guidelines on how to use that but basically you will be able to use your institutional id your university id as well as standard either identities github google or kd uh to connect to the system um and that will really simplify the process by which you guys have been si being signed up because right now there's only a few of you and you, you know uh melissa has been signing you up you know, manually, uh, eventually we're going to have 10,000 users uh, and, and we need some kind of sign up uh, process and flow for that. And this system will actually help. It's a little bit less immediately straightforward than just log on with GitHub. Um, there's a couple of extra steps, um, but bear with us because it's it's uh, unfortunately kind of necessary in the in the brave new world. All right. If there are no questions for me, we can we can move on. Any questions for Frosty about what she presented? We posted a little, there's been a couple posts in the chat too. Of, for example, the OBS tap, you can find it in portal tutorial number three is the demo for that service. And uh, I think there's yeah no tutorial yet for the hips, but they're there um, and to be used. Louise. 
Uh, yeah, just curious um, about the new way to log on. Would new users then still have to go through what we just saw Melissa show us where they asked to be users and then they log on or would they then be able to just log on if they were part of University of Arizona? Already. Right. Uh, so, so excellent question. Um, so it's kind of yes, half yes to, to each of those. So uh, the users will be able, you know, like, let's say you, you don't have access to the system, right? And it's now February, so we've released this new system, right? And your colleague has heard how much, you know, extraordinary fun you've been having with the RSP and also wants, you know, to join, right? So they would go to data to the cloud, they would, they would hit the login button, um, they, they won't have an account, so it will redirect them to, to the sign up flow. Uh, and they will be able to choose, like, uh, they will go, okay, I'm Louise's colleague. I want to, uh, log on with my Google ID. Uh, and they would go through and actually fill in the form. The form then goes, the, 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 the I, I'm just, can I say how I hate this word, but it's a third party system and I kind of like how it's called. It's called a petition. So, <laughs> which, which feels, <laughs> it feels a bit excessive, but I Anyway, so their petition, once they hit submit and have confirmed their email, uh, goes into a holding pen where a member of staff gets to go, oh, yes, this person is actually entitled to access to the system. So, for example, in this phase, this person is a data preview delegate or somebody who has communicated with us and has been granted access to the system. So there is a self sign up process. Um, but also there is, there is kind of an approval flow at our end, uh, so that it's not open to the entire internet. Um, one of the problems with, uh, I think originally the project did actually have this idea that you'd be go, oh, you're the University of Arizona, sure, come in automatically. Um, but of course, as we have discovered, uh, universities never take anybody's identity away. So you could have gone to the University of Arizona like 30 years ago and now live in Kumbuktu and, and, and you know, you still would have your uh, University of Arizona login. So it's a little bit complicated and we're working out with the operations folks how we're going to uh, verify data rights holders. Uh, but from a technical point of view, which is the only thing I really know about, uh, yeah, you can self sign up, you can choose your name and, you know, put in your information and in your email address and link multiple identities together, which we were going to recommend that you do like pick two you never know like you know pick pick universe Arizona and your github or your google or something generic um and uh and then somebody's job is going to be to figure out whether we should let you let you into the party so i, I think like um the answer is yes accounts are still limited and yes we will be asking people to do a form first we can see your name, we can authenticate your data rights. And then when your petition shows up, I can just immediately say yes. People will be able to add, like to petition without requesting first. It's going to cause me a bunch of extra work because I'm going to say, oh, I don't know this person. I'm going to have to go find out who they are. And I'll have to email them and send a polite message. And if we're oversubscribed, then I might have to say they have to wait. Mm -hmm. So there will, it's it is sort of going to be open, um, but the path will sort of, the first steps of the path stay the same, where um, someone submits to a form first, so we know who they are, authenticate their data rights, um, and then they then they use the data.lsst.cloud, use the identity provider to get their account. Um, so, but all that, we will have communications um, in January with the, with the method, yeah. It's a good question, thank you, yeah. Okay, thanks, folks. Okay, thank you, Frosty. Thanks for being here. That leaves us with just uh, one more slide um, for updates for what's to come in 2023. And essentially, it's that our virtual seminars continue. Um, up, like all the updates to tutorials, documentation, et cetera, all that will continue. But um, the thing people are always interested in most is the virtual seminar. So our stat club drop-in sessions restart Friday, January 13th, and the delegate assemblies restart Friday, January 20th with delegate presenter Bob Abel, who will be our first in 2023. We're all looking forward to that. And our third Thursday's drop-in sessions for international audiences will restart Thursday, January 19th. And as always, all the seminar schedules and connection info is available in the documentation at the link below. 
And <clears throat> as sort of a, a preview, we're considering it some kind of DP0 summer school to happen around near the start of summer uh, for all the, the people who continually say, oh, I'm so interested in DP0, but I don't have time or I won't have time until the summer. And we know these people would really um, appreciate a bit of an accelerator to get sort of launched right up to speed um, to doing stuff with DP0. And of course, everybody's summer, summer students will be able to make use of this summer school. So dates to be announced later, sort of as soon as we can lock them down, but um, we do hope to have something like that for you. And that brings us to the end of our presentation. Oh, except for one other thing that's happening in 2023, uh, which Jeff reminded me of, we will be at the AAS. So there will be a Rubin Observatory booth in the exhibit hall, will be next to the Noir Lab booth. Um, so do come and say hi, tell us you're a delegate, tell us about what you've been working on. Uh, let us know if you have a poster that's at all related to DP0 because we like to come and see them. Um, I think summer AAS, there was one or two, and that was really fun for us to see what people had been doing. Um, so yeah, come and say hi at the booth, get your swag, um, and come to the Noir Lab, sorry, Ruben Town Hall. There will be snacks. I believe it is Wednesday evening at 6 p.m. So take a look um, and make sure you come by the, the Ruben Town Hall session. There'll be a bunch of announcements, but mostly they'll be mingling and snacks and drinks. So um, do try to come to that. And that ends the sort of formal presentation part of what we wanted to do today. Any questions, comments about anything that I presented um, or that Frosty or, or Matt said? If you don't want to unmute, questions can go in the chat too. I'm watching it. Will the summer school be virtual or in person? Definitely virtual. That's that's the easiest. Yeah, no one needs to to spend money. We can do it all virtually, and then it'll also all be recorded, uh, which is nice. So. Thanks, Greg. Okay, let's do some flash talks. Just gonna make sure this is refreshed for everyone that might've added one. So what are we looking at? Talk about eight or eight, seven or eight flash talks. Okay. All right, let's do some flash talks. Thanks for everyone who participated in this and gave a flash slide. If you remember, um, or if you were with us for DP 0.1, we did delegate profiles sort of continuously over the year, and that was pretty successful as well. This year, we're trying it just sort of all at, all at once um, to do them sort of at the year end. So um, yeah, just changing it up a bit. Let's get started. Oh, Louise, you're up first. And Brian, if Brian is here. Yeah, Brian's not here, but yes, this is... Um... Uh, my name is Louise Edwards. I'm an associate professor at Cal Poly that's um, in coastal California in San Luis Obispo. Um, <laughs> and I'm PI of an NSF uh, PARE project called Establishing a Diverse Community of Expert Rubin Observatory Users Throughout the California State University System, where the point is to get a bunch of us uh, at CSUs and our students, undergrads, <laughs> Um, up and running with DP0 so that we're sort of experts when um, the data flows in. So we have four different hubs, four different CSUs involved, and myself and Brian at uh, Stanislaus are, have been working for the last year or so on this, and we have a couple of other hubs coming in another year or so. Um, highlights are that we had this wonderful summer data summit in 2022 uh, with a bunch of our undergrads here. Um, hosted by Slow and also visitors from Rubin, including Gloria. And uh, we have about eight students who are currently involved using the DP0 coming up with their own projects, uh, which are listed here. Some of these projects include things like early, or early classification of transients using, DP, uh, do, using deep learning, photometric redshift estimators uh, for DP0, 
uh, looking at color color diagrams and color magnitude diagrams of galaxies and clusters in particular um, and uh, things like that. We've got a couple of posters, student posters at the at the WAS. So if you're there, come uh, find us. And both myself and Brian have contributed to the uh, delegate contributions. Uh, mine is on looking at large structures and Brian's is on identifying transients using force photometry. That's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you very much, Luis, uh, for presenting this program. Um, excellent. Next up, Bob. Hey, everybody. Um, so let's see, I, I have a, a a master's in astronautical engineering from the University of Washington, and I worked at Rocketdyne for for a while um, on shuttle main engines, which are now the Artemis engines and uh, other advanced propulsion systems. And I went back to UCLA and got a PhD in space physics and worked in that field. Um, and then I spent some time working on tidally energized uh, satellites of brown dwarfs and giant planets um, since 2009. I've been spending every summer at the University of Washington working on a variety of Rubin projects and then um, allowing myself to forget them for nine months while I taught at Olympic College and then coming back and trying to relearn stuff. Um, so I'm a professor emeritus now. So I just finished 25 years at the college. So now my summers last all year. Um, and I don't have any specific goals. My, my main goal now is I finally have time to learn how to ask the, um, ask the data the right questions. I mean, it's like everything you want to know about the universe is going to be in this data set. And I want to be fluent in it, in it to, to figure out what the right questions are. So I'm focusing on machine learning modeling uh, right now um, and, and just learning as much as I can. So I've been working with uh, Tina Adair and, and Douglas Tucker and Jennifer Sobeck on uh, modeling, um, trying to identify uh, stars by their colors. So I've got this Sloan Digital Sky Survey. I pulled 5,000 stars out this week and... Uh, and took their colors and, and did a, a few regression fits, different types to um, see if I could predict how well I could predict effective temperature and metallicity and uh, and log G. And then I applied that model. Uh, so that's that's the best fit so far. Um, and then I applied that model to the uh, um, the, the DP 0.2 data set to see uh, what kind of effective temperatures it would produce. And so, um, I just mostly I want to tell you I really appreciate the collaborative nature of this of this project it's just you guys are so supportive I really I really appreciate it and I'm trying to take advantage Good. we appreciate you too Bob thanks for coming to the sessions and engaging with us and also presenting uh next next January yeah it's gonna be great no it's gonna be great <laughs> yeah Cool, thanks. I, I want to say too, um, it's flash talk, so we're not doing questions, but you've got everyone has the Zoom chat. So everyone should feel free to go ahead and use the Zoom chat to ask our speakers questions. Thank you, Bob. Aaron, I saw you're here. Yes. Yeah, I'm recovering from multiple vaccinations yesterday. So hopefully I can get through this in a coherent way, but apologies if not. Um, so I'm Aaron Meisner. I'm a staff astronomer at NORLAB in Tucson. Uh, the title of the DP0 mini project I've done so far, I only joined DP0 as a delegate a couple of weeks ago, um, but the title I've done so far is RSP Jupiter Hub Terminal Bulk DCAM Data Reduction with the LSST Pipelines. So for context, for, for context, we have a NORLAB team, including me, that's building systems based around the LSST pipelines to do a couple of things. That is process raw DCAM data in roughly real time and issue and multi-messenger astronomy optimized alert stream via difference imaging. And then also in parallel, we're working to reduce roughly all raw DCAM data in a manner similar to what is currently done by the NORLAB community pipeline. And so where does DP0 come into this? Well, access to the RSP, particularly its Jupiter Hub terminal is very helpful for various reasons, including it gives us the ability to benchmark on alternative cloud hardware and evaluate portability of our deployment framework. It gives us the ability also to easily test and compare multiple different LSST pipeline versions without needing to install each one ourselves. And I just wanted to say that even though I've only been a DP0 delegate for a couple of weeks, I've had some really great initial success. So in late November, so late last month, I used the RSP Jupiter Hub terminal to reduce about 250 random raw DCAM exposures. Uh, so that's more than 14,000 CCDs, each of which is about eight megapixels unto itself. And these were evenly split between the GRZ bands and roughly randomly distributed across the sky, as you can see at the bottom right figure. 
Um, and the LSSD pipeline version I used was quite recent, V2302. Um, and so interestingly, the total size of my resulting Butler repository, which was dominated by the reduced outputs, is a couple of terabytes located in the slash scratch area of the DP0 Jupyter, um, Jupyter Hub terminal setup. And so, yeah, I mainly just wanted to convey that I had a really positive experience and was really impressed with the Jupyter Hub terminal so far. Uh, it seemed to just work, and I could just run the same. Uh, Butler reduction scripts that I do on our local uh, computer here at Norlab in the cloud this way. And so it was, yeah, very positive experience. Thank you. Great. Wonderful. Thank you, Aaron. It's great to hear about uh, this kind of work and also good to hear that it just worked because that's the whole point. So thank you very much. Alessandro. Hi. So I am Alessandro Mazzi, and I'm a postdoc from the University of Padova in Italy, and a member of the Sora Milky Way Local Volume Science Collaboration. Um, my main scientific interests are in stellar populations, the Milky Way, Magellanic Clouds, and Local Group, the formation evolution structure of the Milky Way, and I'm broadly interested in that analysis. Currently, I am working on a code to derive results of formation histories of uh, large areas of the sky, and uh, I have applied this uh, already to the large Magellanic cloud, and you can see on the right some plots of the result we get. I'm planning to apply it to the small Magellanic clouds, the neighborhood of the sun, and uh, more broadly to the local group. I am new to the DP0, so I'm still learning how to use the ERSP, and that's it. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Alessandro, and welcome to DP0 if you're new. Thank Thanks you for much. joining us. Yeah. Anish, we have you. Anish Dewu. I'm just checking the participants list. Don't think they could join us. I don't see anyone by that name. So we will just read their slide for 15 seconds. Maybe we'll see them in the future. Martin, hi. Hi, everyone. So I am Martin Rodriguez Monroy, and I'm a postdoc at the IJC lab in Auxerre, in France. I'm working with the Macmonians in the Lavoy campaign. Uh, my main scientific uh, interests are basically large scale structure from galaxy clustering to, to, uh, to BAO. Primarily among Gaussianities and all this kind of stuff that is possible with to study with large scale. And I have been also very involved in the observation systematics and the contamination of all for the dark energy survey in during my thesis. So that this is one of my main interests. And I'm also very interested in data analysis and the dim dimensionality reduction methods. Uh, I'm currently working for LSST within the photometric calibration working group. Uh, and basically working with data from the auxiliary telescope to derive photometric corrections for, for the LSST with, from the spectra taken with this auxiliary telescope, and also to derive atmospheric transparency with atmospheric transparency. I'm, I'm also working on a, spe on a special flat building procedure to the, for the spectroscopy, spectroscopic observation. As part of the S, I'm working, uh, I'm a member of the large scale structure working group, and I'm working on the on observational systematics, decontamination effort for year six. And uh, I have recently started to work uh, with DP0 and, and DP0. I'm still uh, investigating it a little bit, and, uh, but in a very short amount of time, I have learned a lot. So I'm very thankful for that. And the main use I, 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 I see in the, in the coming future for DP0 for me is the, to use simulations and some property maps 
to try to implement uh, in for this the the methodologies that we have applied for the years. Excellent. Thank you. Thanks, Martin. Jennifer, hi. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Jennifer. I'm currently a postdoc at the University of Michigan at the Department of Astronomy. Um, so um, uh, I am mostly interested in like um, AGN science. So I'm also a member of the AGN science collaboration. So um, I've been working on things, uh, including like reverberation mapping and characterizing the properties of uh, black holes and also uh, the AGN variability. But um, I'm also uh, working on things like the host galaxy observations of uh, these supermassive black holes, like as you can see in the in the figures, and also their surrounding effect uh, environment, including like the group of or the clusters they're in. Uh, I'm really excited to be in like uh, the DP zero and like learn a lot of stuff about Rubin science. And so next year I will be uh, on a different grant and we'll have time to explore like machine learning applications in time series analysis. So I'm like really excited about uh, spending more time on uh, um, all these like exciting stuff. Uh, I'm also very interested in doing like education and public outreach. Um, for example, like, you know, like uh, getting these tutorials for um, like um, uh, uh, outreach event, like, uh, you know, like just having everyone to interact with uh, LSSD data when it finally comes. So, yeah. So if you have anything that you're planning or you want some extra hand to help, like I'm here and um happy to collaborate on any of these things I've listed. Yeah, thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Jennifer. And just uh, regarding the, because you mentioned EPO and that you wanted to do um, Ruben related stuff with EPO. Uh, the EPO team for Ruben has sort of finished their construction project and now they are sort of going into operations um, and their main website is at rubenobs.org, which is up and accessible now. And so Jennifer, I just wanted to point you at this because there is already like a little game that you could share. If you're doing an EPO, like outreach event or something, um, you can come here and like play this game with them, for example. Oh, that's amazing. Thank you. I didn't know about this. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's, it's really, really new. And I think there's going to be like a big announcement at the AAS about it. Um, so you might see it there. But yeah, there's some stuff on, on here that you can already start to use. So awesome. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for being here. Thanks for presenting. I'm just going to refresh.